podcast of its kind on the interwebs that I'm aware of. I'm your host, Colin Jason F. Matthew Colin Glass. You can call me Jason. Uh, in this podcast, I'm going to look at uh, various topics as viewed through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, the wonderful grammar technology brought to the public in 1988 by the late Colin David Ife Wayne Colin Miller. Full stop. I've gotten pretty good at saying that. I'm eating lunch right now, so I apologize for any lip smackings and cracklings. I wanted to talk about kindness. Now, way back in the day, a few years ago, when um, I didn't have almost 6,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, when I had about half that, and uh, I was still ironing out some things with the grammar technology with my tutor, colon Raven, hyphen Farhad, hyphen Tohidi, colon Afarin. And we noticed that Russell J. Gould, colon Russell, hyphen J, colon Gould, was using, instead of rule one, rule equal, he started using rule one, rule same. Now, to me, same as lame. Sounds catchy, doesn't it? We were wondering, you know, because equal is no contract, because it is a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word, and Russell obviously recognized that because he changed it to rule one, rule same at the time. We wanted to come up with something different. And so for a while... We came up with rule one, rule kindness. And that's what I want to talk about today. Kindness. If you study, as I have, The Fourth Way by George Gurdjieff. And the best way to do that would be to, or the best starting point to do that would be the book In Search of the Miraculous by P.D. Ospensky. O-U-S, Ospensky. Fragments of an Unknown Teaching, I think is the subtitle. Start there. That, actually, that's the magnum opus of the fourth way. There's definitely other books you can get to to get further closure and more detailed closure, such as the three books that Gurdjieff wrote himself. He himself wrote, the first book being Beelzebub's Tales to his grandson, the second one being meetings with remarkable men, and the third one being life is only real when I am. But I highly recommend reading Ospensky's book first, In Search of the Miraculous. So in these teachings, Gurdjieff talks about the word kindness, and he was a big etymology nut. Especially in Beelzebub's tales to his grandson, the words that Gurdjieff chose to use in that book spanned across all languages. Like, he really did his homework. He really used the etymology dictionaries that he had at the, at the time that he had as, at his disposal. And he would use words that were, had common roots across many different languages. And kind was one that he singled out as like his favorite word, one of his favorite words, because it meant family, basically the the concept of family, being close to someone, kin, kindred, kind, kindness. And I'd like to bring that type of energy, that type of spirit to this podcast today. Because I find that when I go out in the public, 
If I'm doing menial tasks, going to a grocery store, a gas station, whatever it is I'm doing. The way to do that safely and successfully without any, as the kids say, static, is to be kind to people. And not kind in a way of, of being weak. There's nothing weak about it. W-E-A-K. There's nothing weak about being kind if you're confident within yourself, your skills, your knowledge, and what you can do. In any given situation on the spot, if prompted. If you are unsure of yourself, whether that's intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, or physically, then there's going to be problems because your kindness is probably going to come off in a negative way to other people. But if you're pretty sure of yourself and everything you're doing, and you're making eye contact with other human beings, that's going to come off. And I know that when I go out in the public and if I see someone that is stressed, if I see someone that is anxiety-ridden, having a bad day, angry, yelling, showing signs of having some sort of breakdown, or as you know, modern psychology would say, a panic attack, whatever it is they call it, I will defer to kindness. I will use the balance of honor and grace. I will use grace. I will be kind. I will smile. Now there are situations where smiling would do nothing but escalate the situation and maybe lead to violence. As someone who is aware, hyper aware of their surroundings, one would have to make those judgment calls on the spot through knowledge. Now again, if you're not sure of yourself, as, as in, I don't know any, any other way to put it, but if you're not sure of yourself physically, meaning you don't know if you can defend yourself or not, you don't know if you know how to fight or not in a situation, that's also going to come off. And in certain situations where someone is... Uh, yelling and screaming or, you know, going off the chain and you're right there when it, when it pops off and you don't know how to fight or, or you don't know how to handle yourself or defend yourself, you're not confident of that, then you smiling might actually escalate the situation and it may turn bad. So in that situation, if I were you, I would just turn around and leave. Turn around and leave. Because if you're not sure of yourself and actually fear creeps into you, then leave. There's no point in you being there because you're just going to make it worse. But we're going to give the hypothetical situation that you do know what you're talking about. As far as being able to articulate certain things, you are confident in your skills and ability to fight or to defend yourself, you're not worried about that in the least, then you can smile. Then that will bring a level of comfort to the situation and the individual will probably calm down. And I have found this to be true 100% of the time. Every time I've been in a situation where I see someone else going off the rails, yelling, screaming, or, or beginning stages of stressing out about something. And, and this is in particular in the context of standing in queues in a grocery store, where it's already created to be a high-stress situation where if there's a lot of people there, and there's only like one or two cashiers because stores nowadays, for whatever reason, want you to go towards the automated section. And even then in the automated section, there's stress and anxiety because you always reach that point where it flashes on the screen, 
you, you need help or call for help or something, and now they got to bring an employee over to help you because they're understaffed. Why are they understaffed? Because these businesses, the, the CEOs of these businesses, most of them that run them and organize them are POSs. They're trying to make money. They're trying to cut personnel. They're trying to cut hours so they can increase their profit. And everybody feels that. And uh, I'm just bringing this as one example. So if I'm in a situation like that, I see a cashier getting stressed. I will actually go out of my way to de-escalate that. For sure. And, you know, 9.9 times out of 10, it works. With just basic human interaction, eye contact, and kind words. Now, some folks, there is no consoling. There is no de-escalating. They're just on their path. And the best you can do is to get through there without getting any strays. You know, without being the recipient of shrapnel. Sometimes you have to pick your battles. You have to pick your confrontations. That's life. The point I'm trying to make is that in these situations, in these social interactions, I lean towards kindness. There is no way, shape or form that I'm going to take something personal in any type of situation like that because no one in that situation knows me. No one knows me personally. They have no idea who I am, my life, or what's going on, what I'm going through. They have no idea. Just the same as I don't know what they're going through, except what I'm seeing right there in the now space on the spot, spontaneously. So anything they say, whether they call me names, insult me, even push me, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm just not. Even, Odin forbid, even if they physically strike me for whatever reason, I probably still will not react in a violent manner. I may defend myself, but I'm not going to attack them. Because sometimes that's all it takes to de-escalate a situation is someone to get that off their chest, throw that punch, boom, they hit you, and it's over. Now they feel bad. Now, if you want to, you can press assault charges in the fiction system if you want to. It's up to you. Me, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I, I like to handle things myself. I would not, the only time I would call the fiction system is if there was perhaps a medical emergency. That's it. Everything else I would handle myself and have handled myself with no issues. So if I'm in public and that happens and I am, I walk into a situation, maybe I'm not paying attention. Maybe I'm not giving my full focus to what's going on around me and I get blindsided. I'm not automatically going to start fighting. What I'm going to do is automatically focus in with laser-like precision and find out whether or not this person is really a threat to me in the safety of my biosphere, my family, whatever, or not. And if they are, I'll do what I need to do to neutralize that threat. Immediately, without question, without hesitation. On the other hand, if I see that they're not a threat, then I will do what I feel will neutralize the situation as in in, in a peaceful manner. Oh, I, I don't know uh, how many people can relate to this, but I'm thinking back now. I'm getting associations in my brain from when I was younger. 
a teenager, early 20s. And uh, as many of you who are regular viewers of this channel, you know that I am a martial arts aficionado. I started out with uh, Shotokan Karate for a couple of years, and then I joined a boxing gym with uh, some Puerto Ricans, got my ass kicked, and learned real quick what was real about fighting and what was not. And, uh, and then from there, went on to wrestling and jiu-jitsu with Muay Thai, Krav Maga, etc., etc. To put that in a simplified form, I did like to fight when I was younger. I did like it on the street. I like to test myself. So I would. Now, I would not purposely bully anyone. What I would do is I would put myself in situations where I would see someone bullying someone else and then insert myself in that situation because I thought I was doing the quote-unquote right thing by protecting someone who was weaker. And I would always go for the biggest guy in the bar. Always. Because the biggest guy in the bar usually thought that they had dominance over everything. So I might do something stupid like walk past them and purposely use my elbow and bump into them and make them spill the beer, their beer on themselves. And then see what they would do. And then if they got confrontational, then, you know, whatever happened, happened. Then they, it appeared to everyone around that they were picking on me because I was smaller. And, you know, I'm, I don't know if you would consider me to be a small individual. I'm six foot. I hover around 200 pounds. Maybe average. I'm talking about guys that are over six foot and outweigh me by 20, 30 pounds. And let's put it this way. I never lost. I may have gotten a black eye or cuts and scrapes, but I didn't lose because I was interested in finding out, just like correct sign structure, I was interested in finding out what actually worked and what didn't work as far as martial arts goes. And I found that in street fighting situations, boxing and Muay Thai were the most important things. Most, I use those techniques from those arts the most. And then when we got in close and started grappling, it was more, even, you know, then it was Muay Thai and wrestling. Although my knowledge of wrestling is very limited, I learned enough to be able to stop takedowns and learned enough to know how to deal with folks who didn't know anything about wrestling. If I got into a confrontation with a wrestler, then I knew I was going to lose and I had to find some other way to deal with it. I had to find some other way. I will bet the house that a wrestler and a boxer meeting in an alleyway both of them the same age, same height, same weight, same years of training experience. For example, they both have a year of boxing. One, the boxer has one year of boxing. The wrestler has one year of wrestling. I guarantee you the wrestler wins. Guarantee you. I put my money on the wrestler. Because the boxer only has one chance to win. All the wrestler has to do is get a hold of you, and it's over. Are you willing to take those chances? Anyways, to get back to kindness, which I've kind of gotten away from, kind of gotten away from, that's pretty funny. Those things don't happen now. I have not been in a physical confrontation in a lot of years. I've entered into scenarios where the possibility of that existed but it never happened and that friends and neighbors to me is an indication that one has learned 
how to safely navigate their vessel through the now space. When you don't have to worry about things like that. Because you are looking at what they would call situational awareness. And this goes for correct sentence structure. It goes for anything. Know what it is you're walking into. Always be looking around. Don't have your freaking face in your phone. Get your face out of your phone. When you get out of your car in the supermarket parking lot, look around. Chances are you're going to see people sitting in their cars. Some of them are significant others waiting for their spouses to come back from the store. Maybe there are some other folks out there sitting in their cars with more nefarious intentions, and it's up to you to be aware of that and be able to calculate that. Because the most important thing is when you come back out of that store and you're pushing a cart or holding bags, now all of a sudden your hands are full, especially if it's dark. I don't need to go through all this stuff. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a quote unquote self-defense uh, teacher. I'm not. This is a grammar channel, but this is the same thing with the grammar folks. Same thing. If you don't know what it is you're doing, if you don't have confidence in what you're saying, if you don't have closure for yourself on what it is you're conveying, then you're probably going to get beat up and robbed. You're going to get walked over, stomped on, and put through the mill. And that's it. Wow, I kind of got off track. See, this is what always happens, folks. I, I started out wanting to talk about kindness and how it doesn't take much to be kind to people. And then I immediately go into teaching psychology of correct sentence structure. It's pretty funny. That's okay. I'll leave it on, though, because I don't think there's anything too dangerous in this podcast. Bottom line, know what it is you're doing. Know what it is you're doing because once you know and you've actually gotten in there and done it, whether that's for real, for real, you've actually gone into a foreign vessel and dry dock or you've built up a repertoire of cases, a portfolio of cases you've won using correct sentence structure, or you've taken classes with me, gotten closure on the grammar, and then I've put you through the quote-unquote sparring sessions where I put you into hypothetical situations where you have to use this stuff. And uh, I put you on the spot. And they're actually pretty brutal, folks. But you have to learn the grammar first. I have to be able to certify that you have at least a rudimentary closure in the grammar. You can teach it. You can create a correct sentence structure on the spot. You can syntax on the spot and explain and give closure as to the syntax values you're banking. If you can do that, then I will be more than happy to put you through some quote-unquote sparring sessions. But you have to have... You, you can't be the type of individual where I ask you a question and then there's 30 seconds of silence. That's not going to work in the quote-unquote real world. You have to be able to think on your feet. And the best example I can give of that would be watch any David Wynn Miller video where he's being asked questions. It does not matter what the question is. He starts talking after the question is asked. Now, if you listen very carefully, you will be able to see which questions he actually answered and which ones he didn't. But even if he doesn't answer or give an answer to a question, he still talks. And to the untrained ear, gives the impression that he gave an answer when he really didn't. But it doesn't matter because you have to be able to talk with confidence and have closure on what it is you're conveying 
and have closure on your position that you claim as a live life claim. And if you have a correct live life claim with three or more live life claim witnesses, caveat, if you do not have three or more live life claim autographs on your live life claim as witnesses to you as a live life claimant, then I would highly recommend you not trying any of this at any time, whether it's through the postal court or through an actual four vessel and dry dock, because you, I'm 99.9% sure you will lose and it will turn out very bad for you. So go back to pre-2018. Watch those videos on live life claims if you can find them with David Wynn Miller. And use those ideas and concepts. Anything after that is not, has nothing to do with actual, pure, correct sentence structure communication parts of syntax grammar. Thank you very much for listening. Be safe out there.